is this person really trying to find the truth? Is this person engaged in the same endeavor that I am? Online, you have an argument with somebody and often they're trying to score some sort of point, right? They're doing it for the audience. You're listening to Good Is In The Details. I'm Gwendolyn Dolsky. And I'm Rudy Salo. And this is the podcast where we learn what we didn't know, we didn't know in the spirit of Socrates. Right, Rudy? <laughs> There's always a pause. <laughs> if you say so. <laughs> Okay. Well, our guest, actually, that's quite fitting because our guest today is Oliver Trolby. He works in the field of epistemology, which has to do with questions about knowing, about beliefs. And I was interested in his discussions or his interest in social epistemology. He has an MA in philosophy from Tufts University, and he is working on his PhD at Notre Dame. So Rudy, what stood out to you about this episode? How uncanny it was because uh, you're going to put the, put a link to this in the, uh, in the show notes, but there was an article that came out today. It's like, it's like crazy. It came out in the Atlantic. It's called the new Puritans. And it's almost like a roadmap for the discussion that we had with Oliver. Like literally it's crazy that this article was being written as we were having this conversation because like it could have been that we were talking to the author of this article. I really highly recommend that uh, everybody listen to this episode and, and take note of where we're at today and be very, very careful with your interactions on social media and sharing political views and other matters. It's it's a scary world out there. You know, we've done a couple things on social media before, but I think this is the first time we've done this with a philosopher talking about the ramifications of our interactions on the internet, on Twitter. What does expertise mean now today? If everybody can just Google whatever it is that they want to look for. And I loved it was the conundrum of if you're looking for an expert, that means you're looking for somebody who knows something that you don't know. So then how do you know if you found the right expert? And <laughs> that kind of a problem or everybody wanting to find their own expert. Really, I loved the conversation. And I have to give a shout out to my friend, Stephen, who recommended that I get in touch with Oliver because Stephen really admires his work. And so thank you, Stephen, for that. Okay, let's talk. Think twice before you post. Oliver, welcome to the show. I am very interested in this question of what is social epistemology. So could yeah. you give us an idea of that? There's a few answers. In traditional epistemology, philosophers were concerned with sort of what sorts of evidence about the world around me, what sorts of inferences or beliefs could I have or make just based on the capacities that I have as an individual. So most prominently, like my perceptions and my rational capacities, right? So I can do math and I can see things in front of me. I can kind of do some experiments. Maybe I can do a little inference to the best explanation. But in general, the picture of the epistemic world, right? The picture of the sets of beliefs we should form, at least this is the line that social epistemologists take when they're trying to say that they're doing something very new. The picture of mental life that they had was one in which what I was rational to do or justified in doing was basically no different than what I would be rational or justified in doing if I was, you know, the only person on earth. So social epistemology kind of starts from this idea, I'm not the only person on earth. And if you think about the way that I go through my life, I rely a lot on evidence from other people. I rely on other people's testimony. Um, a classic case is asking someone for directions, right? You go to a new town, you have to figure out how, how do I get to the grocery store or whatever. I don't know. Maybe you don't go to the grocery store first thing, but wherever you go, you ask somebody where to get there and you rely on their testimony. Another issue is expertise. You, you're coughing, you're sneezing, you want to know what's wrong with you. You go to the doctor, you have to ask the doctor something, you know, your toilet won't, won't flush, you have, have to ask the plumber, right? So we rely on experts, whether it's an expert relative to you just in virtue of living in a place where you don't live or somebody with some sort of credential, but we rely on them to learn about the world around us. And social epistemology is the study of what beliefs should we have given that we live in a world with other people, given that other people know things that we don't, that other people have expertise that we don't, and that other people have had experiences that we haven't had. It's making me think about this notion of expertise mm -hmm. in order to guide our life, because that seems to be a really big issue right now. In fact, I think it was a book by Tom Nichols. It was something about 
Mm-hmm. But do you know what I'm talking about? About expertise yeah. and yeah, I think he called it the the death of expertise or something like that. Yeah. So and Nichols, I was reading and I yeah. was thinking this is a real issue. What is something that we can think about in terms of misinformation and then mistaking that for expertise? Like, what is a lesson that we could learn about what really constitutes expertise? Yeah. So that's a great question. So um, thank you. One. <laughs> so I think expertise is a really interesting topic. It's a topic that is really important in what I call political epistemology, which is kind of like one step after social epistemology, right? Social epistemology, we think about the fact that we're a member of a group, right? In the world, there's a group of humans, not just one human. And political epistemology, we start thinking about the fact that not only is there not only one human, there's not only one group, right? There's a lot of groups of humans. And we need to think about does my group have blind spots? Is the other group trying to trick me? Is my group trying to trick itself? And things like that. This is an important issue in social and political epistemology, the issue of expertise. In a way, the biggest practical question is how do I recognize the experts? Basically exactly what you were asking. So there's a classic paper by Albert Goldman called Experts, Which One Should We Trust? Which introduces what I think epistemologists call the novice to expert problem. The novice to expert problem is exactly what it sounds like. I'm a novice, but somehow I need to figure out who the experts are in this area because I need to know who to trust. Um, I need to figure out before I go to the doctor, there might be a few people saying that they're doctors, right? I need to figure out somehow without being a doctor myself, which one of these people is an actual doctor. Now, there are actually for doctors, there are, you know, there's a kind of accreditation process. There are professional organizations and there's a kind of social apparatus in place that helps us identify who can be trustworthy. And so in the case of doctors, and there, there might even be, there might be less formal methods, right? Before you go to a doctor, you might read, say, a Yelp review. Or again, just like with the directions, you might ask your friends, you know, which doctor do you go to? Oh, you had a bad experience with that doctor. I guess I'll try the one around the corner or something. But apart from those sorts of mechanisms, it's very hard to identify an expert because you're basically trying to figure out who knows the answer to this question without knowing the answer yourself. So if you knew the answer, you could just test them all and see who got it right, but you don't know the answer. So you need to figure out a way of testing whether somebody knows something that you don't. So it's a real issue, it's a real problem. And I think it's an especially, especially a big problem in politics because in politics, we have these very controversial topics that sort of, in a way, the essence of which beliefs are political is the ones that are subject to a certain kind of controversy. It's not clear that experts remain as trustworthy when it comes to political propositions as they do with other propositions. And you get this phenomenon where um, different sides sort of have their own experts and different sides have their own studies. So, you know, if you're trying to ask the experts about, you know, should the minimum wage be higher? Well, some of them are going to say yes, and some of them are going to say no, right? You're going to have different groups of experts with different points of view. So there's a real question of how far expertise can go and how we can recognize the experts without knowing the answers to the questions we're trying to get. I'm just thinking of the role that confirmation bias plays in that maybe one of the reasons why, you know, there seems to be this resentment towards experts. So people are seeking out their own experts, but what's happening is that you have this class of experts, but they're almost not of any use if the person seeking the expertise does not know how to recognize what constitutes expertise yeah. and is instead just looking for somebody to confirm what it is that they think. Yeah, you definitely have this problem in, I think, many areas of political life where people don't recognize the scope, don't recognize that they're in a novice to expert problem situation. When they look for an expert, they think, I already know the answer to this question. And so I'm going to find somebody with the right degrees, the right diplomas, or the right employment history, or something like that. And as long as they agree with me, I'll call them the expert and pretend that I'm deferring to them. I like that, pretend a, that I'm deferring yeah, to exactly. them. Yeah, exactly. So That's we, a really in, good way of putting it. In epistemology, what we think, what we tend to think, you know, an expert is somebody who knows better than you do. So if you're, if you're being rational, if you really think somebody knows better than you do, you kind of trust them, right? You shift your opinion at least a bit to match theirs. Now, it depends on what you think the other experts would be. It depends on what other characteristics you think this person has. Maybe you think they're trying to trick you or something, get one over on you, or maybe you have a lot of evidence for your view, even though you're not an expert. But we tend to think that you should be shifting your view and deferring to an expert when you encounter one. Now, it's a very different situation if you say, I already know what's right, and now what I'm going to do is look for somebody who agrees with me. Mm -hmm. Then you're not treating them as an expert. You're treating yourself as the expert and kind of looking for confirmation, as you say. 
So that's definitely one problem that we can run into. And that sort of thing may be responsible for some of the, you know, what I said before, that there's this fact of expert disagreement, just the fact that on a lot of politically contentious issues, there actually is no consensus among the experts. So this may be responsible for that in that people get made experts because they agree with a certain line or not. But I, I do think that there's, um, you know, there's when Tom Nichols talks about, or somebody like Tom Nichols talks about this phenomenon of distrust or, you know, a growth of distrust in experts, we have to be careful to distinguish between two senses of experts. When we were talking about experts before, we're talking about the people who actually know better, right? We could call this an epistemic authority. Mm -hmm. That's somebody who it's rational to listen to them because they know something you don't. Then there's the people who have, like we said, these markers of authority. We could call that the social authority. In some cases, we really, really expect and hope that these will fit together, right? In the case of the doctors, we really, really hope that the social authorities, the ones who have the, the, the MDs, are also the epistemic authorities, the ones that you can trust when it comes to your medical care. But it's not always clear when somebody says that there's a, a lack of trust in experts, it's not always clear whether they mean people are no longer deferring to epistemic authorities or whether they mean people are no longer deferring to social authority. And if what they mean is that people are no longer deferring to social authorities, then we have to go back and do a little bit more analysis and say, well, are the social authorities actually the epistemic authorities, which would make it rational to defer to them? And if they're not actually the epistemic authorities, then we might say maybe the people are rational in trusting them less. There's been the beginning of COVID, for example, there was a lot of kind of mixed messaging about what people should do, whether people should wear masks or whether people shouldn't wear masks, whether limiting travel to the US would work or wouldn't work. And that was a situation where it was a little bit hard to identify who the epistemic experts were. You might have the World Health Organization and the Center for Disease Control in the United States issuing different directives, giving different kind of advice. You might go on Twitter and see a doctor with 500,000 followers giving you some sort of advice. Then you might go to your own doctor and say, should I be worried about this COVID thing? And that person might give you a different kind of advice. That is when you're in a novice to expert problem. When you see there's a lot of talk out there by people who kind of look like experts through various kind of measures of social authority. And I'm at a bit of a loss to figure out who has the epistemic authority. I was thinking exactly about COVID, how I've seen people say masks don't work. The vaccine has killed 45,000 people. And it, mm -hmm. you can just do a quick search to see the problems in these. To me, having a conversation with somebody about that um, over Facebook, which is something that I actually did try. Mm -hmm. Rudy saw, I, I took screenshots of me trying and it was sent it to Rudy. And Rudy was like, why, why, why? But it was almost like, you know, I wanted to add like, and by the way, the earth is not flat and we did land on the moon. <laughs> But I'm wondering the role of the internet because I yeah. uh, I learned that the flat earthers actually gained more and more traction mm -hmm. once you have the internet. It's almost as though the internet has given us this ability to communicate and to research, but everybody thinks that they are an expert now. Yeah, so I do think that the internet, you know, let's go back to, let's remove ourselves from social epistemology and go back to the individual epistemology, the old traditional epistemology for a sec. It would not have been normal to, or, or, or let me put it this way. Descartes worried, you know, he said, I can't say for sure whether or not I'm dreaming right now, right? But that was as part of a kind of rationalist thought experiment. It was not the case that at least we have to, everybody kind of assumes that it is not the case that Descartes or any of the rest of us were in a situation where sort of half of our perceptions were dreams and half of them were reality you know, we had to kind of investigate to tell the difference. When we wake up from a dream, we recognize it was a dream. We kind of often we forget our dreams. We kind of put them into a little box. Maybe we write them in a dream diary. And then we go about our day and we remember what the actual world was like during the day, right? On the internet, there is no, say, phenomenological difference between talking to somebody who's telling you the truth and talking to somebody who's lying to you. There's no immediate difference between reading uh, an article on a website that's trustworthy and an article on a website that isn't trustworthy. And the same is true of reading a newspaper uh, or even reading an academic journal. There's no immediate sign the way that we tend to think there is with dreaming that you're seeing something that isn't right. So there's a lot of investigation that people have to do to figure out this thing I read actually wasn't true. I have to shift myself away from that belief because it just, you know, it was simply made up. 
And um, I don't know, it sounds like you've tried to do this a few times. I've tried to do stuff like this in probably a different context. And it just turns out that it's very difficult once people kind of get set on a belief and it fits in with a bunch of other beliefs, if it has a sort of coherence with other beliefs, coherence being one of the kind of signs of rationality, it's very hard to shift somebody away from it because the belief fits in to a whole network of other beliefs. And yeah, the internet is very difficult for this. And this can be true of some of the weird sources like the flat earth people, but it can also be true of mainstream sources. And there are good incentives for some mainstream sources and there are bad incentives for some mainstream sources. So an example of a bad incentive for the news is that a lot of journalists are on Twitter and they're eager to be the first one to tweet something and they're eager to get a lot of you know likes and retweets, right? They're eager to be, to be popular. These are things that motivate people. You might not wait for confirmation of a story if it fits the sort of thing that is likely to get people outraged or get people up in a huff you might not think too hard is this likely to be true you might not ask somebody who is likely to disagree with the story or to think that it might be made up and from the perspective of somebody who is not kind of an obsessive observer of the news it's very i think it's just very hard to figure out how to navigate the network of assertions because you have to think about what are the incentives behind all these assertions what sorts of market forces and institutional mechanisms are behind them to figure out whether they're trustworthy even that is on a place like twitter you know a lot of people just say well here are the individuals you know of billions of people who are on twitter people will say i have to just figure out which individuals on twitter i trust and which individuals on twitter i don't trust but obviously many people who are only casual observers of the news who have jobs that are unrelated to information right that are unrelated to following political events they can spend maybe 15 or 20 minutes a day trying to figure out what's going on in the world and in the current information environment that's not very much time, right, to sift through all the different narratives that you say um, about any given event. You know what I'm thinking? I wonder what you think about this, Rudy. I think mm -hmm. that when the reason why it works when, let's say, somebody tweets something out right away because they want to be the first and they know people are going to be outraged, I wonder if there is really there has to be a hunger for the outrage. I wonder if it makes people feel good to be outraged because then they feel like they are participating. And so that's why it's like we almost want that outrage, kind of like the old idea with the news, if it bleeds, it leads, that that's what determines it. We just, and same thing with gossip, it makes us feel like we are participating in the world. I think I, I do not think Twitter would be as successful as it is if it didn't have a lot of outrage on it. I mean, Twitter is, is filled primarily with outrage and comedy. I do wonder if what also helps to put people into camps and put people into piling on to outrage is the fact that here in the United States, we have clearly delineated by color lines. You know, we have the red side and we have the blue side. So if you're a part of the red side and you start seeing this furious uh, ball of fury going forward and you're seeing some outrage because that's about you're a member of that team, you're going to pile on to that. And maybe you don't really peel behind the facts and look to see what, what is actually going on. And if you're on the blue side, you probably do the exact same thing. Right. I mean, because, you know, both sides are capable of outrage. So I think it's a whole bunch of different factors that play in there. Yeah. I mean, I'm thinking so this is a bit of a confession because I had to reflect on a couple of times when I've had a knee jerk reaction and I have been outraged that when I sit back and think about it, I'm like, I think it felt good to be outraged. That's embarrassing to admit, but I think that that's what happened. And so I'm wondering if that's what happened with everybody else. And all of a sudden we're not talking. You're right. We're just like teams fighting. Correct. I remember specifically um, when Donald Trump first took office and one of the very first things he did when he came to office was to kind of uh, shut down refugees and people from the Middle East. And it caused a lot of outrage. Uh, and I took a side, you know, I, I, I went to the airport on the first day and it's funny, you know, we've had a guest on here, uh, Matt Ritter, Matt and I reconnected and became good friends because he also went to the airport and we met up there and then we became friends. So in like, you know, there was a friendship and I saw a whole bunch of people from law school that I hadn't seen and we're like, okay, my team got together to <laughs> battle this, this other team making it so difficult for these people that were on plane flights and these refugees and to come to the United States. And for a long time, I loved being enraged. It actually made me closer to people 
you know, because I because the people that were were outraged like me, people that were taking action like me against something that I thought was a horrible thing made me feel closer to them. And I liked it. That rage was like glue bringing us together. And then I realized I had to break away. Like I had to delete all the all the negative tweets. I had to delete all the negative Facebook stuff. It just wasn't healthy for me. Because I think some people possibly can turn off the rage pretty easily. I can't. Each individual person has to gauge their rage, I think is the, is the best way to, to determine if it's a healthy thing for you to get involved with. Since that, that time, since about you know mid-2017, I just don't get involved on social media on these sides and these rages and these debates. It did feel good to be enraged until it didn't. So I, I mean, I feel you, Gwen. I, I do. Mm -hmm. Some people out there, I think, you know, they, um, they love it. They live for it. Perhaps they're missing something from their life. Perhaps they've been slighted in a way. Perhaps, you know, their team or their side is the underdog or something like that. And they, they live for it, right? It's competition. Politics these days, we have a sports-obsessed country. I mean, our world is kind of obsessed with sports too. We want to take sides. It's a part of who we are as human beings. And that just doesn't stay in sports. Politics is just a new sport. And of course, you're, you're going to hunt for the best expert, the best named expert, the expert with the most amount of followers that's going to support your team. And then that expert, it's celebrity, uh, celebrity aspect to it. I agree about the sides. And I definitely think, you know, in America, we have what they call negative polarization, where we have the two sides that are, but, you know, the blue people, it's not like they really like the Democrats and the red people, it's not like they really like the Republicans. What's most notable and this is, you get this from surveys and you get this just from looking at how people campaign. The red people hate the blue people and the blue people hate the red people, right? That's the main thing. So it's not like they like their own. They hate the other people. That's the main feature of negative polarization. But I think the love for outrage goes even beyond that. And the reason I think this is true and the reason that I think sometimes the, uh, the partisanship analysis of outrage culture is a little, a little limited is because some of the biggest kind of outrage events happen within a group. Somebody within a group has acted in a way that didn't fit with the norms of that group and they get ostracized, they get ousted. Um, you see this in a lot of left-wing circles, you know, somebody- Cancel culture? Like yeah, cancel culture? Yeah, or, yeah, or what used to be called, it's even more what used to be called call-out culture. So call-out culture kind of preceded cancel culture, but call-out culture was a, entirely within left spaces. It meant if somebody acts a way you don't like, you sort of publicly say, hey, this person is acting in a way uh, that I don't like. And they say, oh, I'll try it. I'll be better. I'll do better. And that preceded cancel culture because cancel culture is even more public and you don't get really even- wait for them to say that they'll do better, right? You just sort of kick them out. And cancel culture is also kind of cross. It's not just on the left, right? It's not just in left wing spaces. So I think there is this love for outrage. And I don't know enough about human beings to understand why we love being outraged so much. I love it when I have a gotcha, you know, I love it when somebody makes some mistake and I can point it out. I love when somebody acts in a way that, you know, when somebody professes to be a really good person and they act in a way that isn't like that, you know, I love doing that. I don't know why I love these things so much. They're not great things. They're not things that I'm proud of about myself. You know, I have a bit of a Twitter presence and I try not to feed into these things. I try not to jump on whatever the thing of the day is. I try not to, um, there's this thing on, on, on Twitter called quote tweeting where you sort of put somebody else's tweet up for display and make fun of it. I try not to do that so much anymore. But when I do those things, those are the things that made me popular on Twitter and those are the things that get the most popularity now on Twitter. People love the combat. You can't even really call it intellectual combat. It's rhetorical combat, but it's usually not exactly intellectual combat uh, because there's an element of kind of superficiality to it. Probably gotten even worse with the pandemic where maybe some people would have these combats or discussions in person, right? Maybe, yeah. maybe it would be a little bit more tame. Maybe they wouldn't be attacking the other people because, yeah. you know, you're worried you might get your ass kicked or you might, you know, some, something bad will happen or, or you know, somebody will get offended and something will happen. But I do feel like as a result of the pandemic and people being separated and they're already enraged, I, I think it's exploded. Uh, yeah. And, and, until, and until we get back to some kind of a society, where we can where right. we face to face and live with each other and realize, hey, that person that you might think is red or blue is actually a normal human being. Yeah, I think a ton of people have been online basically for the entire pandemic. I know that for me, you know, last summer my Twitter following exploded. I know that a lot of um, uh, on Twitch, which is the site where people watch other people play video games, you know, viewership there has gone way up. Basically, anything you know, people have been socializing and 
having their leisure time on the internet, which is, you know, for me, I've been like that for a lot of my life, but for a lot of people, it's new. And, and a lot of these sites have blown up like that. So yeah, I TikTok. think, um, yeah, TikTok has really blown up. So we've, we've talked about two things that the internet changes. One is the amount of information. So you can always find information that confirms your viewpoint because there's just so many people out there and somebody has made a website saying the crazy thing that you already believe. So you can already find somebody and act like they're an expert on the internet. So that's one way that the internet has changed things. Another thing, Rudy, that you're saying that the internet has changed things is it kind of increases aggression between people because there's not this face-to-face -face element. And you know, part of it, you said somebody would kick your ass, but I think, you know, Part of it is you don't see body language, you don't see cues. People famously like cannot understand sarcasm on the internet. They can't understand playful humor on the internet, right? So people just get everything makes people a lot angrier. And I think there's, a, there's two more ways that the internet changes things in these regards. One is this phenomenon that's called a context collapse. So context collapse occurs when you say something kind of as part of a certain sort of group, right? So you might have your Twitter followers. So a famous example of this is, um, I think her name was Justine Sacco. Have you heard of this? She made a joke about uh, AIDS. Uh, oh yeah, and she ago, got on that, a plane. And yeah, and she got on a plane and when, and there her this hashtag, has she landed yet? So she was in the air this whole time didn't know this was happening. And by the time her plane landed, she had lost her job. It was like a 12 hour correctly. flight or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, so and it was just like Twitter a blew totally up. Totally yeah. inappropriate joke, gets yeah. on a plane, is offline. And then that tweet was known yeah. by everybody so that by the time she landed, yeah, she saw that yeah. she had been and doxed I think, pretty much. I think what had happened with the joke was that it was a joke that it had a kind of edge to it, but it was people who knew her would interpret it in a certain way. And people who didn't know her, it wasn't clear to them how they were supposed to interpret it. And we can think of tons of, right? Like a lot of humor is just like, you'll pretend to be something you're not. You know, if I do like a Donald Trump voice for my friends and make a joke about like, we have to do this to these people or that to those people, right? They'll understand that I'm doing like a little act and it's a joke. If I do that on the internet and somebody who's never met me before sees it, they have no idea whether I'm joking or serious. So humor requires a lot of social context and a lot of humor is acting in a way that you wouldn't usually. The reason that it's kind of bonding is that people show that they understand you well enough to know that you're joking. Right. With context collapse, people don't know you. It's yeah. people who don't know you who are gonna see this. So we're in these bubbles that then explode on the internet. And then another issue, this is maybe the fourth thing that is different about the internet. There's just this very odd element of virality that suddenly, you know, things can spread to all these different people. I was having this discussion actually on a date a few weeks ago, and uh, we were talking about how things blow up on the internet. And I was saying, you know, even if I said something really horrible to you in this bar, first of all, you probably, you would just get up and leave the bar. You would be like, okay, this is a bad date. I'm leaving. If you were very, very offended, you might get up and say, hey, you know, people around me, listen, here's what this guy just said to me. And then you, you like, and this is like a really extreme case, right? This would be very notable if this happened on a date. If somebody said, listen to this thing this person just said to me. Even that would only be five or six people who would listen to you saying it. So the bad thing you did would spread to maybe five or six other people in your near vicinity. On the internet, if I say something bad, millions of people can see it within minutes. Millions of people can form an opinion about me and engage in a so-called discourse. Of course, mostly free world, as we're saying, by outrage about what I've said. So a lot of our normal human ways of deciding what to say just don't work anymore. On the, it's on, very on, difficult on, to on the internet, right? You're, you're, on the you're internet, trying, yeah, 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 yeah. You're tying that to, yeah. yeah, yeah but yeah, the funny thing, thing is yeah. that the internet is kind of like, especially with cell phone videos, you see these things where things that aren't on the internet can be put on the internet. Text messages can be spread on the internet. You get these things... Someone like John Jonathan Haidt is very worried about this, about, you know, 15 and 16 year olds being ostracized from their social circles because something they say is recorded and put on Twitter or even just some, you know, you could just tweet, Bob said this to me yesterday, you know, isn't that awful? And suddenly everybody in your school sees it. So it's, it has this element of gossip, but you're gossiping with the entire world, which is it's just truly odd. Oh my gosh, the way and you put that there, you're gossiping with the entire world. It's, I think it's a crazy thing. Yeah, so I think people really need to be careful that they don't do that to other people on the internet. And you also need to be careful to not give people cause to do that to you, which I haven't always been as careful about. Yeah, I mean, I think we're all guilty of that, right? Yeah. And I think, I think our, our, even as we're, you know, the internet and especially social media hasn't been around for all of our lives. I, I feel like we're all relatively within the same age range other than Gwen, who's perpetually 25 years old. <laughs> uh, we, you know, you, we, 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 we it, 
we're, it's all a learning curve. And because of cancel culture or because of call out culture, I'm sure a lot of us has, have learned at the expense of others. Be like, oh, okay. You know, like don't make any jokes that could be misinterpreted on yeah. Twitter. You know, I, I have no idea what that AIDS joke was and I wouldn't make an AIDS joke on Twitter in any event, but I'm sure that probably caused a lot of people to think like differently about, you know, putting any kind of joke that's right. out there. So it's like, right. it's a learning process that we're all going through. I mean, you know, we all mature. I mean, there's been plenty of things that I've that I've said in my youth that I would never say today because I've matured and, I, and I've mm-hmm. grown up and I've gotten to know the other side of things. And that applies to the internet. I've even taken the position now of, I have very particular views of politics and treating mm-hmm. people, but I kind of keep those to myself. I don't even put that onto social media. Yeah. I just, I just don't. I mean, I, you know, that's not jokes. Like this is like how I feel and mm-hmm. how I think people should be treated, but it's too much of a slippery slope. You know, at, at, a, yeah. at some point, what's going to happen is social media is going to be filled with people that make jokes that don't offend anybody people that make jokes that only offend people and these enraged sides, you know, that that's all the people that are going to be putting out the content and will get the most followers. I think everybody else is just going to watch the crazy show from the sidelines because it's, yeah. it's just too damn dangerous in my opinion. I wonder if there's going to be a tipping point where people go back. I mean, I never, uh, you know, in, in the university setting, I don't allow for my lectures to be recorded. Mm-hmm. And the thing is that it's not because I'm afraid of something being taken out of context. I say plenty of things in context that I don't want put out there. <laughs> One of the classes is philosophy of sex and love, our current mm-hmm. debates in sexuality. Mm-hmm. And so I need to have a space for my students and for myself to be able to have discussions about these issues and I don't want to live in fear that something that I have said, like I said, doesn't have to be out of context. In context is still could be seen as problematic. But I would imagine that for a lot of professions, just as you said, because the cell phone can just be, you know, someone can put Mm -hmm. a recording up on the internet and then that can be the end of you. And I even know with podcasting that I am so grateful for you, Oliver, and for all of our guests who have been on the show to trust me Mm -hmm. in that editing process, because I'm recognizing that it's a different level of trust now when we say, hey, can I interview you? Can we have this discussion? That there has to be this faith that I will put out the best version of this conversation for everybody to learn and to enjoy. But there's like a whole new level of vulnerability out there because like you said, God, now that you said that gossiping with the world, you're right. And just going back to being extremely careful about what you put out there. One of the reasons, uh, you know, right, 2017, you know, very angry Rudy about what was going on in the world, how we were treating everybody. There was this transformation in 2017, 2018, where I took kind of all of that rage and I focused it on something that is universally hated by all sides of the world. And so I can throw my rage at it. Brussels sprouts? Uh, traffic. That's, oh, okay. that's, re- that's really, that's really when I became the <laughs> hardcore transportation guy and like kind of put all of my energy into that because it's something, if you could find something that everybody hates and you're not going to offend anybody over it, it's a lot easier to put your name out there and become, become an expert and you can get people from both sides. It's just, I, I just wanted to kind of bring it full circle in that. Yes, I hate traffic. Yes, I've been in, into public transportation my entire life. Yes, it's part of my day job. But there was also a um, real thinking behind it. I did want to focus on a subject that everybody can get all on the same side on, and, I'm, and I won't offend anybody. Yeah, I do. I do have kind of regrets within philosophy about sometimes I think, what if I had just done the metaphysics of modality or some like, you know, one of these abstruse analytic topics and just tried to come up with some argument or another and just wouldn't have had, you know, people out there who, you know, wouldn't have been polar, you know, to an extent I've polarized people a little bit. Writing about political topics has engaged me to, to do things like this, right? To be in contact with people who I would never have met or heard from otherwise, but some of those people don't like me, right? And I think one interesting thing about, I'm somebody who, when I learned that somebody out there hates me, it bugs me. me even if Oliver, I've never, me too, man. Me too. Yeah. I, even me if too. I, yeah. It's even if they can't affect my life in any way, I just think about it. I'm like, oh, they're out there thinking this thing about me that isn't true and hating me. You know, it just it makes me sad. And I think that it's yet another way in which the internet dynamic like feeds on itself and makes itself worse, right? Because what it means is that 
a lot of the people who are like, who have the most staying power on the internet, who are the most successful on the internet, on Twitter, on social media in general, are people who just, they don't care if anybody hates them. And you think about, well, what sort of person doesn't care if anybody hates them? You know, it'll be, maybe it's a certain kind of courage in some people, but in other people, it might be associated with personality traits that you don't like as much. I think most genuinely like kind people, if they find out somebody hates them, they're like, well, gee, why, why do they hate me? I, you know, maybe I'll try to fix that, right? It makes you reflect, right? Exactly. You, you will literally, you know, if you're an empathetic, you will take the time and try to think of, well, could I be doing something differently or could- Exactly. What did I do What wrong? did I do wrong? How can yeah. I improve? Man, I am, I couldn't agree more with you. I, I that's how I am. I really, yeah. I swear to you. Yeah. I, I, I made this tweet when I first started realizing that, wow, people out there are starting to hate me a bit about just like how many- for one person who likes you, you know, like what's the exchange rate, you know, <laughs> if you could get one, one more person to like you, how many, you know, how many people who hate you? And I found out that actually among people I talked to about it, there's a very wide variety of answers that people will give. And I did know one person who just said very high number, doesn't matter if anybody hates me because they're not going to do anything to me. And the people who like me, especially if you're selling something, you know, say you're a band trying to sell tickets to a show. This is my favorite example of this. If you're a band trying to sell tickets for a show, it's not like the people who hate your music, they can't like take money from you. They won't buy tickets to the show, but neither will the people who are neutral. So if you're selling tickets to a show, you don't really have a preference for people hating you versus being neutral. You only care about the ones who like you and who like you enough to buy tickets to the show. So I think people who are, whether it's selling subscriptions to Substack or to a podcast online, or trying to sell a book that is maybe one of these books that gets people outraged, at least the economic calculation is going to be, doesn't matter whether they hate me or are neutral with me. What matters is if I'm polarizing so much, the better, right? Because people who are neutral, they're not going to buy my stuff. And so to me, they're equivalent to people who hate me. But no matter how hard I try, I cannot make my brain work like that. Um, and I have tried. <laughs> and you, you know, you nailed it. Not everybody out there is going to like every song. Not everybody out there is going to like every book. Not everybody out there is going to yeah. like every movie. But if you could capture that audience, right? And if you can get them really excited, you speak to them because this is something that's very important to them. And if they all go out and buy it, man, you're, you're a success. Yeah. And that's it. I mean, you nailed it right there. If you half-ass it because you're trying to appeal to the people that might not like it, then you yeah. might only get 10% sales. Exactly, yeah. Online. And it turns out, I think... For me, at least, this is an area where what you said about the tribes, the different teams, the different sides, this is an area where that's really important because from what I've observed, a good way to find people who are going to like you enough to buy your stuff is if it gets spread by people who hate you enough to kind of performatively, you know, the hate clicks, the hate shares, the people who say, look at this crappy thing. Well, that circulates out to the people on the other side, right? And they think, oh, wow, this is pissing off this group so much. Uh, so I want to be part of pissing off the people that I don't like. So I'm going to buy this thing, even though who knows if I'll like it. So there's, there's these very bad dynamics that I just don't have the kind of psychological constitution that enables me to, to take advantage of for, for better or for worse. I want to wrap up with a question. Mm -hmm. I had noticed that you had written that you were investigating an arguments that were worth having. What brings you to the conclusion that an argument is worth having? That's a great question. Um, Thank you. I should, <laughs> I should say that in my life, I argue too much. And uh, that is yet again, a thing about my mental constitution that I probably won't be able to change. But when I look back and say, was that argument worth having? I think the main factor usually is who are you having the argument with? Some of that is about, is this person really trying to, to find the truth? Is this person engaged in the same endeavor that I am? Online, you have an argument with somebody and often they're, they're trying to score some sort of point, right? They're doing it for the audience. I'm not somebody who really understands how to argue for an audience. I'm usually aiming everything I say at the person I'm talking to. So I think that's one thing. Another thing, like we were talking about expertise, right? You have to have an assessment of how much does this person actually know about this topic? What capacities does this person have that enables them to evaluate this topic? If you come to the view that just... I'm an expert relative to this person and they, they don't really understand what they're missing, then it's not going to be productive for you to continue having the argument. So you need to be kind of talking to somebody who has the same interests and also like a similar level of knowledge that you have. And I think that's the main thing. The main thing is you have to find the right interlo interlocutors. You have to find the right people to be arguing with. But yeah, like I said, in my own life, if somebody starts an argument with me, I'll usually engage them. And I know often this is is the wrong thing, right? Often if you say, if you see this person is, oh, they're talking about, you know, they think the earth is flat. 
often you should just kind of throw up your hands and say, well, you know, enjoy that. Good luck with that. <laughs> I really like that point, Oliver, is that it is upon you, the individual getting into that argument to assess Try to be fair, try to be as objective as possible about the fairness of the of getting mm-hmm. into this argument. Are you talking to somebody that actually knows what they're talking about? Like, yeah. Is this a person who has studied, let's say, for example, if you if you start because this is a pretty common arguments that you see all over the place, you know, have they studied Middle Eastern history? Have they taken a class? Have they read a book? Why are they arguing X? Like, yeah. Why even engage that person? If you have so much knowledge. And, and this person doesn't, is, is that really an argument worth getting involved with? Shouldn't you just kind of save yourself and say, you know what, that's nice. It's great that you think about that. I'm going to go on my merry way. I think that's critically important for a person's sanity to do yeah. that, that quick audit before they get into to an argument. Sounds like that's what you're saying. Yeah, basically. And then there's other, you know, there's other things that I think are, you know, a bit more straightforward. You know, like if somebody is throwing insults at you during an argument, you have to feel you know, empowered to just say, I'm going to cut out of this. The other thing, you know, something I've just noticed online, we talked about context collapse. You have a group of people who you aim something at, and it kind of is shown to people outside of that group. You have a different kind of context collapse that can happen during arguments where in the social media age, we used to worry about this with like presidential debates. You remember people used to worry about sound bites mm-hmm. that, yeah, I mean, what an old fashioned worry, right? Now, now the entire world is sound bites. So the, the same worry that people had with sound bites during presidential debates or political debates in general, that can happen to anybody now, right? You're in a Facebook argument, you, you know, and you've seen, I'm sure Gwen, you were talking about arguing with some of these people and you know how it goes. You say, oh, there's a hundred replies. And if somebody takes a screenshot of your 50th reply without the context of everything else you've said around that. And then they they just show that around and they say, look at this thing that Gwen said, might not paint you in the best light, right? So that's something that I've also had to, to learn to be aware of that even though I'm having a conversation with somebody, if they are opportunistic about it, they can treat every individual thing I say as though it's kind of a standalone statement. And that also is just like completely contrary to the way most socialization has worked before the internet. Um, so it's another thing that we just have to get used to. And, you know, just another reason to be very thoughtful about who you actually talk to and what their what their goals are in talking to you. It almost feels like since we're all on the internet now, that it's almost like the logic of the mutually assured destruction, that if everybody is on enough, then every, gosh, that's, that everybody can have a sound bite. Hmm. Well, Oliver, this was just a fantastic, I learned so much. I honestly, I did not really know where this was going to take us in terms of social epistemology. And we covered so much. I love oh, the discussion yeah, yeah. about expertise, about the internet. I These are the kinds of conversations that I love where we can get into academic philosophy and then at the same time show how it will relate to everyone's life. And definitely the internet and the way we engage is so important and is very yeah. helpful for everyone. Everyone can relate to it. Yeah, it was a lot of fun for me as well. I really appreciate you having me on. Thank you, Oliver. Oliver, thanks a lot, man. Gave me a a lot to think about. And definitely, you know, I really hope people take notice of the warnings that have come out from this. um, (laughs) This just kind of goes into the theme uh, once again and of please, please, please give thought to anything before you put it out onto the internet. Yeah, yeah. I think it's very important. I do. Be careful about what you, yeah. Be careful about the internet. Be careful about what you read. And yes. also be careful about what yes. you write. You need to be Amen. careful in both directions. It's the it's the wild west out there. Amen. It's one of the reasons I love doing the podcast is because I think that the art of conversation and dialogue is being reduced to tweets, sound bites. memes, yeah, sound bites. And I think that people genuinely enjoy being engaged in ideas. And so mm-hmm, it's yeah. just so fun to have created this space to kind of return to that, just have a throwback to dialogue and conversation. Agreed. All right. Well, thank you, Oliver. Oliver, have a wonderful day. You yeah, too. you too. Nice to meet and you, and I, I just wanted to say the only book on your shelf that I can see the title of is Infinite Jets, but it's one of my favorite books. So, <laughs> so I have a good opinion of your bookshelf. Just one. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> good talking to you guys. Later, Cheers. man. Thank you so much for listening and thank you for the DMs, the emails, the texts, the shout outs on Twitter. When you're enjoying an episode, it means so much to us. 
And if you would like to get in touch with us, if you have any questions, or if you'd like to advertise with us, good is in the details pod at gmail.com. And if you're enjoying the show, please scroll down to the bottom of Apple Podcasts and hit that five star review. And we're also on Instagram, good is in the details pod. And if you would like to support the show, we're on Patreon, patreon.com slash good is in the details. I will put that link in the show notes and the article that Rudy had mentioned in the intro from The Atlantic. All right. Well, again, thank you so much for listening. Thank you for the support. It just, we're enjoying putting this out there. And I'm so happy that you all uh, seem to be enjoying the show too. And also, if you wanted to email or shout out on Instagram of topics or ideas, those are more than welcome. And until next time, bye.